Take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We'll begin with verse 16. Matthew chapter 6, verse, uh, verse 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you that they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thine face. When thou appear not, uh, that thou appear not unto man, or to men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Heavenly Father, I ask for your blessing to us today as we look at these few verses. Father, there's much to learn about fasting, its purpose, its, its, uh, its work in the heart of the, thy people. And I ask that you'd bless us today as we look at these details, look at some of the facts involved around fasting when men fasted and how they fasted. Father, and the glory that is received by thee when we fast and pray. We ask your blessing upon us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. The subject course is fasting. It is not a deep theological course here. We're not going to get into deep theological subject, but into a deep theological subject that's going to you just fill us with all sorts of wonderful aspects of and the greatness of God. It's just something very simple called fasting. In this petition, we come to the third aspect that our Lord's been dealing with in our religious life. The first re reflected on righteous acts. In other words, the doing of good deeds and our general dealings with men as Christians. And specifically, he gave us an illustration in the form of almsgiving. This was an illustration of a righteous act that we as a believer in Christ would do. Uh, and, and almsgiving was, was the illustration of that. And it taught us that we're to do good works. The Bible tells us that we're to do good works. Not to be seen of men or to receive praise from men, but we do this secretly. We do this because we're Christians. We do it because it comes out of our heart. It's our desire to do that. And then the Lord will re reward us openly for that which we do in secret. And we saw also that these things were not even to be noticed by ourselves. We weren't supposed to pat ourselves on the back. We're not supposed to let what the right hand know and the left hand are doing, are we? Anonymous, even to ourselves, we're just supposed to do good works because it's expected of us of the Lord. And the second aspect we looked at in in relation to our religious life was that of dealing with God, and specifically through prayer. How to spend time with God specifically in prayer, and the and the Lord said, "This is how we ought to pray," and so He teaches us how to pray. And we noticed that the first thing he taught us was uh, that uh, to pray was to, to speak of the hallowedness of God's name and how we should frame our request and how we should be thankful and worship and reverence and what we should offer up in our prayers. And it was, and we spent a lot of time just looking at those various aspects of the Lord's prayer, teaching us how to pray. Well, we come to the third aspect this morning of our religious life, and it's in, it's in these two verses, and it has to do with the submission of our mind and our body to Christ. It is bringing all things in us under the control of Christ. The mortification, as, Dr., as Webster defines it, the mortification of the body or appetites. 
That's what fasting deals with, is the mortification. And the word mortification, mortify, or mortician, means to kill. So we're to kill the body and the bodily appetites and the appetites of our mind so that we could better serve Christ. That's what fasting is all about. Now I'm going to digress just a little bit. When we think of discipline, we often associate it with corrective or, puni or, or punitive. Punitive discipline from some form of action in order to take uh, to correct a wrong or an inappropriate behavior. We use this with children. Little small children, when they misbehave, they go sit in a corner or they get their bottom spanked or something like that. Some punitive damage, damage, <laughs> that's the wrong word, some punitive action to correct their misaction or their attitudes or their actions which are not acceptable. So there's a punitive work involved there. Employers will use it when, when employees get out of line or don't do what they're supposed to do. They usually have some punitive action that they take against the employee. Extra days off or, or a reduction in, 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 in work or, or, or there's any number of ways that you, know, you can get written up. So there's a, a various ways there. And God certainly uses it in relationship to his children. In Hebrews 12, 6, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son, he receiveth. So um, the Lord takes his children, and takes them out to the woodshed, and gives us a little bit of a whooping from time to time, doesn't he? In fact, he says that, that every child of his, he scourges. In other words, he takes corrective action and discipline upon us. But the word discipline itself primarily means education. Discipline means education, instruction, cultivation and improvement, comprehending instruction in art, sciences, correct sentiments, morals and manners, and, and, and due subordination to authority. To someone to discipline themselves means that they do something to, to, uh, that is usually repetitious and they do it regularly because it's a discipline to help them to learn and to gain um, uh, skills that wouldn't come unless you disciplined yourself to do them. There are various disciplines, they can't call martial arts. A discipline, which means that there's continuous practice to do them and an, an intense education. So there's all these things that are involved in discipline. While we might not properly call fasting as discipline, it nevertheless, nevertheless requires a degree of determination and discipline to maintain and it is certainly instructive, correcting our sentiments, our morals, and our manners. It is certainly useful in personal humility. And before we deal with fasting, I want to actually look at discipline that is formative and instruction as the children of God. Discipline that is purposed to bring about proper habits, actions, and responses of which fasting is a part of. We'll look further into fasting as we go. But first of all, there is, as far as disciplines of the believer, one is the discipline of prayer. Prayer is a discipline of the Christian, of the believer. We are to pray often, and the scriptures teach us to pray often, doesn't it? In 2 Timothy 2, he says, I will therefore that men everywhere pray everywhere, Lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. So men are to pray. We are to pray. As God's people, we are to pray. And if we read through the scriptures, what did God's people do? They prayed. They prayed. They offered up prayers unto God. And then not only that, we're to pray, pray 
fervently, for it says, for the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It says that over in James. We are to pray according to the example of our Lord, as we looked at beginning in uh, verse uh, uh, 10 of our, or verse 9 of our text, which says, after this manner, pray, or therefore pray ye. And so he gives us instructions on how to pray. When we go into our prayer closet, when we have that season of prayer, that time set aside specifically for prayer, that we are to pray in a certain manner, and the Lord instructed us on how we're to do that. Prayer is an essential discipline in the life of the believer. When we don't pray, then what are we doing? We're, we're not acknowledging the Holy One of God, are we? As we ought to be. Prayer takes many forms. It takes the form of thanksgiving. It can take the form of praise. It can take the form of praying for needs, not just for ours, but for another. There's the prayer of mercy and the prayer of, prayer of grace. It says that if we any man uh, needs, if we, if, that when we find ourselves in need, that we're to come before the throne of God and to pray for mercy and grace. And then, it's, then we have supplications, supplement, uh, supplicating for others, and intercessory prayer. These are all forms of prayer. But another form of prayer that we often don't think about is meditation on the scriptures. Do you know when we meditate on the scriptures, we're fellowshipping with God over those scriptures? And it is also a form of prayer. Prayer is something that a believer is to be intimately involved in. It's like breathing. We need to pray. Prayer is often, or, or is, off, is offered sometimes at specific times. We have morning prayers. We may have evening prayers. You might be like Daniel that prays three times a day, which has specific times set aside for prayer. It is also prayer, pray, it, pray, we are to pray at any convenient season or at appropriate times. There are times that are appropriate to prayer. One of the times is before we, we eat, we're to offer up our prayer and thanksgiving to God for providing for us the food that we have. So prayer is a very appropriate for the Christian. The other discipline involved in the, with the believer is that of reading the scriptures. Reading the Holy Scriptures. I, I really have a difficult time with people who profess to be Christians but don't read the Bible. Because the Bible tells you how to live a godly life. Isn't that what being a Christian is about? Is it learning about Christ? Learning about God? All these things are found in the Word of God. How do you learn about salvation if you don't learn about it from the Word of God? So how can one claim to be a Christian but not discipline himself to the reading of the Holy Scriptures? 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, As newborn babes desire, as newborn babes Desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. In other words, if you're a newborn babe, it is a natural thing to desire your mother's milk. Is it not? I mean, what's the first thing that they do with a newborn babe? They put it at the mother's breast so it could suckle. And it has a natural desire to suck, doesn't it? That's what babies do. And as if you're a newborn babe in the Lord, your desire is to eat that milk and to drink that milk. You're going to have a desire for the Word of God. And you know what? I have never met a person who their entire life, that after they stopped being a baby, that they stopped eating. I mean, we just eat and eat and eat and eat. We're to eat of God's Word. We move from milk to meat. We, we, we got that little baby, it goes from pablum, and then it goes to, to, to soft vegetables. And, and then, then finally, when it gets some teeth, it wants to eat some meat, doesn't it? So what we do is we train our children, and they learn how to eat. And so do we, are to eat of the Word of God. In Psalm 119, 103, it says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The Word of God is sweet. To the believer, even when it convicts us of sin. Bless God, the Word of God convicts us of sin. And it has a sweetness because it also tells us of the forgiveness 
of sin that's in Christ. Mm -hmm. So there's the reading of the Holy Scripture. Another discipline of the believer, or ought to be of the believer, is that of meditation. Just sitting down and ruminating on the Word of God. Meditating on what the Word of God has to say. Psalm, 1, Psalm 77 says, 12 says, I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of all thy doing. The Bible talks a lot about meditating on the Word of God. If you read the 119th Psalm, David speaks a lot about meditating on the law of God. In 1 Timothy 4.15, it says, Meditate upon all these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy proffering may appear to all men. So we proffer or profit in the meditation of the Scriptures. You know, you'll learn a lot more meditating on the Scriptures than just simply reading through it. People think read through it and they think they meditated on it. We're going to be getting into Hebrews probably next Sunday. There is so much there that we often miss. Just miss. And if we miss it there, we're going to miss it in other scriptures because we don't meditate on the Word of God. We just don't think about it or think of the complexities that are there or even the simplicities that are there and enjoy them. How many blessings do we pass by and the ignorance that we have because we do not meditate on God's Word? You know, just a simple word makes a difference. A simple word that we read past it and don't even think about it. I was thinking about this this morning, or and yesterday in fact, where it says, where Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And we quote this verse so many times, but we don't think what it says is, was lost. Past tense. Meaning it isn't lost anymore. And you don't have to you don't have to know Greek to understand what that is saying, that, the, that God has saved those whom he has elected to save because they were lost, but they aren't anymore. It's an aorist infinitive. And I'm not going to go into what that is. Just the simply fact that, that Christ completed the work in the saving of his sheep. They just hadn't come to their conversion yet, but they will. They absolutely will. Then another aspect of, of a disciplined believer is he's to have a disciplined walk. How he walks is important. We're going to be careful how and where we walk in this world. Now, I don't mean just going out for a walk down the street. I'm talking about our lifestyle. How we live in this, as the scripture says, this wicked and perverse world. Now, we are to avoid not just evil, but the appearance of evil. If it appears to be evil, we should be avoiding that. We are to be just in our, all our dealings. I didn't say fair, I said just. There's a difference between being fair and being just. Because sometimes you can be fair and not just at all. Just is that of being right of being upright, of making wise decisions according to the word and law of God. That is how we're just. When we're with our children, we, aren't going, we ought not to be fair with the children. We ought to be just with our children. There might be a good reason why Tommy can have twice the size of a cake, piece of cake than Susie. Now, Susie might be three years old, but Tommy might be 16. And it isn't and, and so Susie goes, it isn't fair. Look how big of a piece of cake Tommy's got. But Susie would get sick eating as much cake as Tommy might eat. It is good that she only have a small piece and a Tommy have a bigger piece. That's what I mean, the difference between fairness and justice. Or being just or being righteous. But we're to have a disciplined walk. We're to be just in all of our dealings. Pay our bills on time. We're to act just among people. Right? You know, there's a lot of fairness going on out there that isn't right. A lot of fairness that isn't just and it isn't good. 
We're to be righteous in all our actions. Righteous meaning upright. We're to be upright in all that we do. Our motives are to be pure. Why do we do certain things? Our motives are to be pure. There's a lot of people who do things, but their motives are not pure in doing it because they want to get some kind of a, something to come their way and their direction. They want to gain from it. it. Happens all the time. Our motives are to be pure. Our sp speech is not to be defiled. And, and I've heard people professing to be Christians using some disgusting language. Even taking the Lord's name in vain. And I wonder, how can you do that and be, able to be a child of God? We're to dress modestly. We're to dress in clothing that doesn't show off our bodies. Everything about us is to have the appearance that we are the children of God. That's how we're to appear, as the children of God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 well, I have 15 and 14. I think it's supposed to be 14 and 15. But it says, See then that ye walk circumspectly. The word circumspectly means that you are to walk in an upright manner. And I don't mean just standing up and walking with your two feet. I mean your lifestyle is to be that which is right and just. We're to walk circumspectly, not as fools. So if you don't walk circumspectly, you must be walking as a fool. And not as fool, fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So what are we to understand? We're to understand the will of the Lord. Now, we have his declared will before us, and we can know for certain that that's the will of God. But there's other things in our life that we may not know what the will of the Lord is, and we ought to know. So we redeem the time. And one of those ways to come to know what the will of the Lord is in something is to fast and to pray about it. Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says, Walk in the wisdom toward them that are without. Those who are without, in other words, outside the church, unbelievers, would walk wisely before them. Because we want them to know that we are Christ, that we belong to him. We're to walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Now, that's a wonderful illustration. Uh, I like my food seasoned. I, I like spices on my food. You can ask my wife. I'm just going to dump all the seasonings you can on it. I like that flavor. I like garlic. I like onion. Some people may not like it as well as I do, but I like it. Seasoned with salt. I like salt, too. They tell me I'm not supposed to eat as much salt as I do. Well, we'll find out. <laughs> that, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. When a man asks, we can give a, a declarative statement from the Word of God, and, and the proof of it is in our life. That we have walked in wisdom and give every man an answer that asks us of, asks of us. So we're to be disciplined in our, in our minds and submission to Christ. We are to be submitted to Christ in our minds. We are not our own. We are bought with a price, the scriptures say. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. So what are we to do? We're to renew our minds. You know, our minds get full of garbage. And, you know, they say garbage in, garbage out. That's true. But if we spent time and disciplined ourselves in the Word of God and put the Word of God in our mind, we would be then not conforming ourselves to the world and to worldliness and doing the things that the world wants to do and having worldly thoughts and worldly philosophies because there's a lot of people who profess to be Christians this whole philosophy is worldly and not biblical. There's a man that used to say, we need to learn to think biblically. And we ought to, and the only way that we can think biblically is to immerse ourselves in the Word of God. 
So it says, be ye not conformed to this world, but, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, the changing of our mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do we know the will of God? By having our minds renewed, by being, tra being transformed by the word of God, then we can know and discern the will of God. Then over in 1 Peter 1 13 says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Now I'm going to back up there just a little bit and give an illustration that to understand what it means to gird up the loins of your mind. Now, in, in, in the days when the scriptures were written, men didn't usually wear pants like this. In fact, pants like this weren't invented except for by the Persians. And it was women who wore the pants. In case, if it's someone wants to do some study, the, the uh, wearing of, of pants came from Persia, and it was the women, and the men didn't want to wear them because they considered it too feminine. So that's a that's another study to go into. But anyways, they, they wore uh, long robes, and to run in them was encumbering. In other words, you're going to trip and fall if you wore your, 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 your robes down. So what they would do is they would pull them up, and they would tie them up so that their legs would not become entangled in their clothes. And that's what it means when it says to um, gird up the loins of your mind. It's taking the loose edges of your clothes and tying them up so that you're not encumbered. The, wherefore, gird up the, the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is, that is to be uh, brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So our, we are to be sober in spiritual things and in godly things. And, we can, and that's the submission of our mind and our hearts to Christ. Then over in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, Casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. There's a lot said right down there. We have a lot of imaginations in our mind. Things that exalt themselves against Christ. And we hold them in a high place in our heart, in our, in our mind. But we're to even take our thoughts and bring them into the captivity of Christ. Our minds are to be centered on Christ and not on other things. Now these are all disciplines that we as the child of God are to practice. These are the disciplines of the Christian life. Now we're going to spend a little time and back up a little bit and go back over to fasting. Fasting is always connected with prayer in the scripture. It's never mentioned alone, except for in the, this text where it speaks about fasting, but we never see fasting spoken about separately from prayer. Fasting and prayer in the scriptures go together. This is why we often do not refer to fasting alone. Fasting is good. It's very, very good for your health to fast. There are a lot of people who practice regular fasting who know not Christ. I mean, it's just something they do for their health. But the scriptures talk about fasting and prayer. And fasting seems to be a lost discipline among the children of God. You don't see much fasting these days because men are no longer convicted about sin the way they ought to be. Churches are no longer convicted about sin they ought to be, the way they ought to be. And so fasting doesn't become very important to us. You know, we're very used to being comfortable. Are you comfortable? Everybody's sitting in a nice chair, have plenty to eat. Fasting presents something of a problem to the Christian today. Because fasting requires a bit of uncomfortableness. You're going to be uncomfortable for a few days when you start fasting. We are in the habit of eating, and most of the time to excess. To fast would interrupt our habitual eating cycle and cause us some physical pain. How many of you are into pain? <laughs> right? We're not really into pain. 
And to fast is going to require that we suffer some pain, doesn't it? It's all in your head. <laughs> and it is. I mean, our brains are and our stomach are connected, believe it or not. And when we get hungry, we just hardly, we just can't hardly stand it. Fasting is something that the scriptures teach us that we're to do. Fasting is very healthy for your body. It actually heals your body. There's much healing that can be done through fasting. People may not believe that, but there's enough studies out there to prove that fasting is good for you. I found it very good for me when I fasted for several days. You know what? I no longer had to take insulin shots. My blood sugar was perfectly, nor perfectly normal for days. I did not have to do anything to fix my... I, I was afraid that my insulin, my, my sugar levels would drop so low I'd be in trouble. No, sir. There's a lot of correction that can go on in fasting. It brings our bodily appetites or lusts under control. Denying the body food allows us to... Let's look at some biblical examples of fasting. There's fasting as a result of an emergency or emergencies. David, at the impending death of his son, fasted. In 2 Samuel 12, 16, uh, 12, yeah, 16, David therefore besought God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And while his son was sick, he fasted and implored and pleaded, and pleaded with God for his son. So here was an emergency situation where David fasted. Also Jehoshaphat, who was, who was king in, in Jerusalem in view of the Moabite invasion. The Moabites were ready to invade Israel. And in 2 Chronicles 20 verse, 30, uh, 20, verse 3, it says, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. He had all of Judah fasting before the Lord because of this impending danger or emergency that, was, that had arisen there in their country. Then we see that, that, we are, that fasting is appropriate in times of protection. In Ezra 8.21, we know that the walls of Jerusalem were totally destroyed. And Ezra and the people of Israel had come back to Jerusalem and the, world, and the walls were, were down. They were destroyed. And, and Ezra said, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might afflict ourselves. Now the word afflict ourselves is the word for fasting. That we might afflict ourselves before God to seek a Seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. They needed the protecting hand of God upon them. And they set a fast where they would pray to God and ask him to oversee and to protect them. And God did protect them. Then there's a, a, a need for fasting when confronting demonic activity. In Matthew chapter 17, 20 and 21, Jesus had just come down from the Mount of Transfiguration with three of his disciples, and there were other disciples there, and they were trying to cast the demon out of a young man. And Jesus said unto them, because you're, because, and they said, well, why can't we do it? How come we've not been successful in doing this? And Jesus answered them, or Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have the faith as a grain of mustard seed, he shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible for you. How be it? This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So in, the, in, in confronting demonic activity, prayer and fasting is of necessity. We ought to be praying and fasting when dealing with demonic activity. And then we see... That, that, prayer, that prayer and fasting is necessary in discerning the Lord's will. 
Before a man ever enter into the ministry, he ought to pray and fast discerning the Lord's will. And other men with him, and we're going to get into that, in the sacred duties of the ministry. In fact, I'll just touch on it now. In the sacred duties of the ministry, prayer and fasting ought to be a continuous practice among the ministers of God. <coughs> in Acts 13, verse 2 and 3, it says, And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate unto me, or separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So there was prayer and fasting before the Holy Spirit had called out Barnabas and Saul. And then there was fasting afterwards when they sent them away into the gospel ministry. The gospel ministry ought to be bathed in fasting and in prayer. In seeking the Lord's will and discernment. In Acts 10 verse 30 we have the story of Cornelius. And Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Cornelius wanted to know about the things of Christ. And so he was praying and fasting. And at the same time, Peter <laughs> was getting a message from the Lord, wasn't he, when he was praying and fasting. And God sent Peter to Cornelius where Peter could preach to him the gospel of Christ. But when we need to understand and have the Lord's discernment and the Lord's will about something, it ought to be banged in prayer and fasting. It is to be done at the ordination of elders. In Acts 14, 23, it says, And when the Lord had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they, on whom they believed. So there's to be prayer and fasting in the setting of elders in the church of Christ. And finally, an ex uh, the, third ex the last example is in time of great spiritual need. In Daniel 9, verses 3 through 5, it says, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fastings and sackcloth and, and ashes. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from the precepts and from thy judgment. Daniel was praying for the nation of Israel who had been taken captive into Babylon. And he was, he was in intercourse with God's uh, uh, intercess, with intercessory prayer for the people of God. And it was a time of great spiritual need. And in our churches today, there are great spiritual needs that we are so ignorant of, at least we shouldn't be, but we are, that there ought to be great fasting and prayer about them. Churches sin, sometimes they sin horribly and make terrible decisions. And yet they just keep going on in it instead of stopping and confessing their sin and, and falling down in, in great uh, uh, contrition with fasting and prayer about their sin. Now there's some particulars about sin in our text. In our text, he says, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites, a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head, and wash thy face, that they may appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. First thing is, is that fasting is not to be mechanical. Remember the man who prayed in the temple, and he says, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that sinner over there, that publican over there. I fast twice a week. That's one of the first things he mentioned. Uh, thank you I'm not like that man. I fast twice a week. Man, that must make me really wonderful, because I fast twice a week. Mechanical fasting. Notice the Pharisees fasted twice weekly. Now, there is no sin in having a set day for fasting. If you fast on a particular day, and you always fast on that particular day, there's no sin in that. The problem comes is when fasting on a particular day becomes mechanical. 
You just you're just gonna fast on day because you fast on that day. What happened to fasting and prayer? When you give yourself to fasting, you're to give yourself to prayer. That is not mechanical. But you know, a mechanical device runs without purpose or thought as to what it's doing. It just runs. It's mechanical. They were mechanical. Fasting twice a week showed that that it, it was part of their religion. And they just did it because it was part of their religion. It's just like, I don't know if the Catholics still do it. You know, they had fish Fridays. It's mechanical. It's Friday, you have fish. Now, I don't know what all the original purposes was of it. I'm just saying that Friday's fish day. <laughs> yeah. I, like I said, that, it was mechanical. It's just what they did. They needed, to sh they needed to fast so they could show their devotion and spirituality. And in doing so, they also needed everyone else to know that they fasted. In other words, fasting is a duty of my religion. So I'm going to fast. But I also want everyone else to know that I'm fasting. Hey, look at me. I I'm real religious. I'm really dedicated to my religion because... I'm fasting. That's what they did. The biblical purpose of fasting was for spiritual reasons, not for religious reasons. We got to disconnect religion with spirituality. They did it for religious reasons, but not for spiritual reasons. It should not be, I fast, therefore I am properly religious, or that fasting shows devotion. Fasting is connected with prayer, and it is an intimately spiritual experience. Now, the second thing is fasting is not for exhibition or to be put on, expedition, on, on exhibition. True fasting never is never condemned by the Lord. True fasting is never condemned. In fact, he tells us to do it. But the Lord condemns exhibition of fasting. To exhibit and to say, look at me everyone, I'm fasting, the Lord condemns. These Pharisees, they put on a gloomy face as if they were deeply troubled in heart and spirit. I mean, they were just sad and big. And they walked around in such gloom and doom. They wanted everybody to know that they were fasting. They, and they tried to demonstrate this as some form of piety. See how, pi how pious I am? How religious I am? They, and, and they didn't wash their face. They didn't comb it. You know, well, now that I got my hair short, you wouldn't know whether I got up and combed it or washed it or anything. Now, but uh, when your hair's longer, and you get up in the morning, you start walking around, and you didn't comb your hair. Your hair is definitely out of place. You might kind of look like a scarecrow. I mean, my hair just kind of matted at one place. It stuck out on the other side. And I had to go in and wash my hair or get some water on it and groom. These men wouldn't groom. They wouldn't wash their face. They wouldn't wash anything. They wanted to look like they had, were fasting, deeply pious, spiritual man. They didn't groom themselves. But a lot of them, what they did is they did put ashes on their heads and walked around in, in deep mourning and great humility before God. However, it was an act. Look at verse, look at verse um, um, 16. Sad of face, for they disfigured their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. They weren't fasting at all. They wanted just men to think that they were fasting. So they put on their, their ashes, they put on their sad faces, and they didn't watch anything, and they walked around in, in deep, well, supposedly deep contrition and humility because they wanted men to see that they were fasting when they weren't even doing that. Would you call that hypocrisy? <laughs> I think I would. 
You see, any attention, that they want to draw attention to themselves. And there's nothing, now there's nothing in our religion as Baptists that is self-serving. You read the scriptures, and if we practice the scriptures, none of it is self-serving. Everything we do is to be done for the glory of God. Everything that we're to do is to be done for the glory of God. No man should ever preach for his own glory. He should always preach for the glory of God. It's not self-elevation. He ought to be a humble man. Any attention that we draw, let it be as a righteous people. People, if we draw the attention of any person, let it be because we love the Lord. And if they can see the Lord in us, our attitudes, our actions, our dress, our speech, we, we walk in this world and we want to draw men to us that we might preach Christ. Our lifestyle should reflect the love of Christ above all things. Fasting, we aren't to fast like a hypocrite. These men were hypocrites. Notice verse 16, that they may appear unto men to fast. These were not actually fasting, but they were pretending to fast. Appearance was everything to the Pharisee. Appearance was everything. That's what they wanted. Now, I do not doubt that among the Pharisees there were those who actually did fast. But the majority of them, as a society, it was an act. They were filled with hypocrisy. There are, you know, and there are many religious pretenders out there. I've seen them. I've heard them. They stand out in front of the people and say one thing. But you get them in the back room, and it's a totally different story. It's an act that they put on for the people. But in their personal lives, they're hypocrites. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourself, neither suffer them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses for the pretense and make long prayers. As a whole, the Lord wrote a lot about the Pharisees and he called them hypocrites. They appeared as pious, they appeared to be righteous, they appeared to be religious. But it was only in appearance only. Appearance only. Dear believer, the Pharisee was in his own mind. He believed himself to be righteous. He truly believed he was righteous. He believed he was good. And that he was a teacher of the law of Moses. But do we also behave in the same, man, in the same manner as these hypocrites do? Sometimes we think we're pretty good in our own minds. And we really aren't. How real is Christ to us? How devoted are we to being like Christ? Are we in obedience to the Lord? Do we at times pretend to be the servants of Christ? Because we say that we are. We've got to at least make an outward appearance. Or is Christ in us the hope of glory? We walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. These Pharisees received their reward. They received the reward and praise of men, but they didn't receive the reward and praise of God, did they? The believer in fasting. Fasting and prayer is a true and righteous work that is to be engaged in in the believer when led of the Lord to do so. In times of great spiritual when we, when we are in great need of spiritual wisdom or spiritual intervention, those are times that we need to fast and pray. And the scripture nowhere designates a time when we're to fast. In, in Mark 20, 20, it says, But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. It didn't say when we're supposed to fast. We will fast, and we're to find reasons to fast. And we have plenty of reasons to fast. All you have to do is just stand in the mirror and look at it. <laughs> We fast in dire distress and certain dangers when we're overcome and controlled with some habits of life that, that we know aren't pleasing to the Lord. We need to fast and we need to pray. 
We have successes. We want to have success in some ministry. We fast and we pray. Or because of some sin that's in the church. And we are pressed to pray and to fast. We fast and pray and find understanding in the wisdom of God. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. They give to all men liberally, it tells us in James. We fast and pray when we're overburdened with the cares and troubles of this life. We simply, or simply when we're burdened of the Lord, to fast and to pray. Romans 8.13 says, If we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, or of the body, ye shall live. Mortify means to kill the deeds of the body. And sometimes the only way we can kill the deeds of the body is simply by fasting and prayer. In, in Colossians, now, the book of Colossians is written to a church, in verse 3 through 5, it says, Mortify therefore the members which are on the earth. The members, those things that are in our body and in our mind. The first thing he says is, Fornication, which is adultery and pornography and all that, that is what's considered as fornication. Then he uses the word uncleanness. And it's funny how, how many of these words that he uses deals with sexual sins, which are part of the body. Uncleanness is of every sort. All other impure actions as adultery and incest and sodomy and every other unnatural, unnatural lust he's dealing with, with uncleanness. And then inordinate affections means affections that are beyond that which is natural. And we have natural affections. And, uh, there's natural affections for our children and for our brothers and for our sisters and for everyone and, and, and for life itself. But an inordinate affection is a desire that is beyond normal limits. And, it also and it's also called in scriptures vile affections. And, and this is uh, the infeminate and the abusers of of mankind with themselves. So there's all sorts of vile affections that go beyond that which is natural and which God has made. And then there's the evil concupiscences. Now, do you know what? There's something that, do you know concupiscences is okay? It's evil concupiscences that is it. Concupiscences is the desire for sexual intimacy. That's concupiscences. But it says evil concupiscences is that which which is which would be natural and right with your wife, but evil concupiscence is desire for sexual intimacy with someone other than your wife. You know what the Bible says? You look upon a woman to lust after her. You committed adultery with her. That's evil concupiscence. And then covetousness, which is an immoderate love of money and the root of all evil. The Bible says it is an insatiable desire of having more and having more than your own. What's yours, you want more. You want what someone else has. And then he calls that the same as witchcraft or as idolatry. It's the same as because you love this more so much, it's idolatry. It's like idol worship. And every term here deals with inward evils of the heart. And if unlept check and if left unchecked, will lead to a debauchery of life. And he's writing this to a church. That's where fasting and prayer comes in, to bring these things under control. The scripture teaches us that these things are in us, and no one is exempt. They're in us, even as believers. And when God saved us, he did not remove the old nature that still wants to do some of these things. Now, some of these things may have passed from us when we were saved, and they, and they no longer give us a problem, or it may not, we may not have had any propensity towards it to begin with. But not all things do pass. And therefore, these things that remain, the Lord has provided us a way of escape. And one of those is through prayer and fasting. By denying the body food of, of, of uh, by denying the body food with that of prayer, we are able to bring both body and mind and 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 our passions into subjection. Of Christ, fasting and prayer is good for the body, good for the believer, and it brings our passions and our mind and our body into the conformity of Christ. There is an inward strengthening that is gained by fasting and prayer. Spiritual growth comes by fasting and prayer, and it's something that we ought to be exercised in. You have a scripture that you don't understand that you want to understand. You bring it to the Lord and you fast and you pray about it. 
and asks for God for wisdom in understanding the scriptures. And you know something? It says that when we do that, this here, that thou appear not the men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. You know what? You take your prayer and your fasting before him, and he answers our prayer. He helps us in bringing our body and our mind into the submission of Christ. That's an open reward, isn't it? In 1 John 5, 14 and 15, or yes, it says this, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us, and we know that he heareth us. Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have um, uh, the petitions that we desire of him. When we become, when we come before him in fasting and prayer, having to deal with these issues in our life, and we know it's according to the will of God, because he tells us that we're not to be filled with these passions, that we're not to be filled with these sinful thoughts and ideas and actions. It says he will give us the desire of our heart, that is, to serve Christ. And he'll reward us openly by doing so. Thus rewards are openly and granting in the granting of our request by giving us his goodness and his mercy, enabling us to mortify the sinful lust of our body. That's what we're to mortify. That's what we're to put away. The filthy things of this life so that we can be Christ-like in our activity, in our mind, in our actions in our life is to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for thy grace to us today. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for thy word, for teaching us thy word, teaching us about fasting. Father, I pray that you will magnify Christ in us and through this day in your son's name.